Welcome to Broadway Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Cheryl, and you have joined us on week four of our Money, Sex, Power sermon series. Pastor Nathan is going to be sharing from God's Word in just a few moments. But before we continue, I would love for you to hit the like button on this video as it helps to spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please do so right now. Today is also Celebrate Sunday, and as a church, we celebrate communion and baptism. So now is the time to gather your elements, some crackers and juice, and immediately after the sermon, one of our pastors will lead us in a time of communion. Now, in just a few moments, the worship team is going to come and lead us in a time of worship. But before that happens, let's watch this video together about an event coming up in February. It's the coldest night of the year. This is an event that City Reach has participated in for nine years, where we, along with a bunch of others all across our nation, walk to raise money for the hurting, homeless, and hungry in our community. Check out this video to see how you can get involved. A few years ago, we stood on this very same spot to make a big announcement about the coldest night of the year. As you know, Coldest Night of the Year is our yearly nationwide walkathon fundraiser for the City Reach Care Society. And this year, we need your help more than ever. That's right. This year, as the needs of our community have increased, so has our fundraising goal. Are you ready, team? This year, our goal is to raise $200,000! Listen, 200,000 is a big goal, but City Reach is growing at a rapid rate. Did you know that according to Food Banks Canada, the average food bank in Canada has grown 35% in the last three years? Did you know that City Reach's food bank, our Food for Families program, has not grown 35%, not 55%, not even 75%, but 1,000% in the last three years? We've now become the largest fresh food bank in Vancouver. That's right. And did you know that our City Reach Club Freedom Program is directly helping with the opioid crisis going on in our city right now? Now, according to the BC Coroner Service, just last year there were under 2,300 deaths because of drug overdose. Each week, our team welcomes guests in and serves 250 hot and nutritious meals in three different cities to people who are dealing with addiction, homelessness, and mental health. The need all around us is huge, and our fundraising goal is big, but we can do it together. We need your help. Our number one need right now is for team captains. So gather some friends together and sign up as a team to walk together to raise funds for a great cause. If you're new to Coldest Night of the Year, it's so easy, it's so much fun, and you'll be making a huge practical impact on the needs of our community. So please sign up today and join us on February 25th, 2023, as we walk for the hurting, homeless, and the hungry. You can join as an individual, as a business, or as a team. Sign up at www.cnoy.org slash cityreach and help us reach our goal. Let's do this together. Woo! Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Desiree and I am the Young Adults Pastor here. And guys, I'm so excited because today I have a very special guest with me. So why don't you go ahead and tell us who you are and what you do around here. Hi everyone, my name is Cherry and I'm the new preteen director of the Vancouver campus. Amazing, and even though you're the new preteen director, you're not new to Broadway. You've worked at City Reach, you were working at Out of School Care, you're a part of youth, young adults, you're on the worship team, so many different areas of our church. Yeah, and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Well, Broadway, we have a ton of stuff happening here for you and your families. So why don't you check these things out? We are excited to announce an upcoming men's retreat on March 24 to 26 at Solway Camp and Conference Center. Men, save the date. Details and registration are on our website. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with Pastor Andy. Today, we have an information meeting about our short-term missions trip to the Yukon. 
This trip is for both youth and young adults ages 15 to 25. The info meeting is happening at our Vancouver campus after the 11.15 a.m. and 6 p.m. services in room 203. Please attend if you're interested in going on this trip. Broadway Basics is a three-week course about who we are and what we do. It's also a prerequisite for membership, so if you're interested in learning more about Broadway or becoming a member, please join us. This class is available at all campuses and begins next Sunday, February 5th. Please sign up online. If you have little ones aged zero to five, we would love for you to join us at Parent and Talk and connect with other families and their kids. It happens on Thursday mornings between 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the nursery at the Vancouver campus. For more information or if you have any questions, please contact Pastor Monica. Next Sunday, February 5th at 6 p.m., we are kicking off our first encounter night of the new year and it's happening at the Port Coquitlam campus. Encounter Night is an evening of uninterrupted prayer and worship, and you are not going to want to miss it. All campuses are invited. If you are looking for ways to connect and build community, joining a small group is a wonderful way to grow spiritually and meet new friends. If you would also like to participate in a small group as a leader or as a host, we would love for you to connect with us. For more information, check out our website or you can email Pastor Andy. If you miss anything that we said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on all of our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Hello, Broadway family. Welcome to church. Are you ready to praise? Come on, let's all stand and thank Jesus for all he's done for us. Lord, we look to you. Let's sing. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, oh, we look to the sun. Let's put our hands together. Let's go. Oh, we look to the sun. Carry through the dead of night See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light Freedom shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears Come on, we sing Beyond the skies above, Lord, reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises for us. To kingdom come See the hope of heaven Shining like the rising sun and Now forever Lifted up from death to life and There's no fear in love And no darkness in his endless light Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Here we go. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever.
reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God, beyond the skies above, we are reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God.
sing it out. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise.
Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust this sweetest friend But wholly trust in Jesus' name Come on, we sing again, my hope is built My hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend But wholly trust in Jesus' name Come on church, you sing In Christ alone today there is no other name above your name that's the name of Jesus the name that has power to move the mountains we believe there's no other name oh. 
Come on, lift your voice. We sing Christ alone. In your love, through every storm. strong really stood out to me because I think at some point in our lives all of us have felt weak all of us have felt like we just don't have enough to keep going like there's just too much in front of us and like it's insurmountable and I just have this feeling that in this room there are some people who are feeling weak whether it be physically whether it be mentally maybe it be spiritually and so if that's you, if you need to be made strong, if you need healing in your life, I just invite you to open up your hands to him because he is a God who wants to give. He is a God who wants to heal. He's a God who wants to strengthen you. And so if you're comfortable, just open up your hands to him as a sign, God, I want to receive your strength. And so Lord, we come to you this morning, no matter how we're feeling, no matter how weak we may feel on our own, God, you are strong. You are more than enough. And so when we feel like we are at our end, God, I pray that in those moments, you would just prove all the more how much we need you, how much we should depend on you, and how strong you are. God, we desperately want more of you. And so I just pray that you would draw near to every person in this room, that you would bring healing where there needs to be healing. You would bring hope to the situations that need hope. And God, would this just be these, these the lyrics, this song, be something that we can hold on to, not just today, but throughout our weeks. And so God, would you just be in the center of everything that we're doing, this whole service our lives, our days, we commit to you. We love you, God. And we pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. Welcome to Broadway Church. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship today. Now you've joined us on what we like to call Celebrate Sunday. And today we celebrate communion and baptism. If you have made the decision to follow Jesus and are considering taking the next step to be baptized in water, visit bway.ca slash baptism for all of the information that you need. Now don't forget to get your elements ready as one of our pastors will lead us in communion right after the sermon. We are now going to transition into our time of giving. If you are new to Broadway Church, please feel under no obligation to give. You do not have to pay to watch or attend church. However, if you would like to financially support what God is doing here at Broadway, we would love for you to do that now. Our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on our website and check out the online banking giving option. We can accept your credit card over the phone if you call the church office. You can come in in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you would like to drop it off. You can also use the text to give. If you text the word give to the number on the screen, it will walk you through all of the prompts to get that set up. Or you can mail in your checks to the church. Now we'd like to encourage you to take some time after today's sermon to discuss what stood out or spoke to you the most, perhaps with friends or family members. We also want to help by providing some discussion questions based on today's topic immediately after the sermon. 
Once again, Pastor Nathan will share a great message with us in just a moment, but you still have time to hit that like button on this video as it really does help us reach many more people and share the good news of Jesus. Thank you once again for joining us today. When I'm dealing with money, sex, power I know there's a way to do it all When I'm dealing with money, sex, power I don't wanna be the one to fall When I'm dealing with money, sex, power I know there's a way to do it all When I'm dealing with money, sex, power I don't wanna be the one to fall Man, I'll never no. find peace if I'm letting these Take your place in my life, they take energy I don't wanna go back to my past hurts Yeah, I really need you, yeah, I need your word When I'm dealing with money, sex, power I want to start today by telling you about an awkward situation that happened between one of my best friends and my grandma. I know it sounds weird, just bear with me for a moment. So one of my best friend's name is Aaron, and it just so happens to be that my brother's name is also Aaron. And one day I get a text from a random number saying, hey, this is Aaron, this is my new phone number. I immediately just assumed it was my brother and I updated his contact information. A couple months later, I get a call from my grandma, and at the end of the phone call, she says, you know, I've been trying to get a hold of your brother, but I can't seem to reach him. And I'm thinking, well, duh, it's because he got a new phone number. Here, let me give you his new phone number. So I send my grandma what I thought was my brother's phone number, not realizing that it was my friend Aaron's phone number. About a month later, my friend Aaron's like, hey, Nathan, I, I just got off the phone with your grandma. And I'm like, whoa, bro, I don't know anything about friends and grandmas and the bro code, but I'm pretty sure you just crossed the line. And he's like, no, 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 your, your grandma called me. And now I'm like more confused than ever. So he gets a call from my grandma and she's like, hey, Aaron, it's grandma. And he's like, dude, your grandma sounds just like my grandma. So he responds, hey, grandma. And they have this entire conversation, not realizing that they weren't talking to who they thought they were talking to. And he's starting to get worried. He's thinking like, does my grandma have dementia? She's asking me like questions that make no sense. Like how is living in Toronto and how's film school? And, I, and he's like, grandma, I, I live in Vancouver. I'm a paramedic, are you okay? Needless to say, it's one of the most awkward situations he's ever been put in. Can you imagine having a whole conversation with somebody when someone thinks that you're someone that you're not? The imposter syndrome would be real. I don't know if you've ever heard imposter syndrome before, but it's when you're surrounded by people and you feel like you don't belong, like you're not really who they think you are. Today, to be honest, I feel some pretty heavy imposter syndrome. Why? Because I've been asked to speak from the Bible on a topic that I personally feel unqualified to speak on. We're in a series called Money, Sex, and Power, and we're talking about how our culture has taken these good things and twisted it, idolizing them. We're looking at how we as Christ followers should respond to each one of these topics. And I have the wonderful pleasure of covering the sex part of the series. Now, this is where the imposter syndrome kicks in. If you know me at all, you know that I'm not married. I don't have kids, I'm not exactly an expert in this area. And at first I questioned why I was even asked to speak on this. But that's honestly exactly why I was asked. We could easily fly in some sex expert and hear a TED talk about the best sex practices, but we're not here to listen to someone's opinion. My opinion doesn't really matter. What matters is God's opinion. And that's what we're here today to discover. So this message is actually part two of our discussion on sex. And so if you weren't here last week, I strongly encourage you to check out the sermon online. Last week, we talked about our battle with sex. And we laid a foundation that's going to help us in our discussion today, which is all about overcoming the power of sex in our lives. Last week, we came to the conclusion that God is the only one qualified to tell us how to live our lives. We live in a world that is fighting for our attention. We are told that money, success, relationships, power, religion, and yes, even sex is the purpose of our life. But who's the only person qualified to tell us why we exist and how we're designed to live? It would be our creator, God. We learned some fundamental truths 
that God made us. We didn't just pop out of nowhere. We didn't just bring ourselves into existence. We have a creator, God. We need to learn number two, that God made sex. Sex in and of itself is not bad. God created it for a very specific purpose. We also learn that number three, sex is powerful. To deny this is to deny reality. Sex can be used for good or evil. It can bring people together. It can tear people apart. And because of all of those truths, we learned, number four, God sets the guardrails for how sex is to be experienced. God being the creator tells us that anything outside of God's original design for sex to be experienced is considered sexual immorality. Listen, it does not take long to recognize that sex, when it's misused, can lead to some pretty devastating consequences. Sex has the power to bring life into this world. Sex can be used also as a weapon. Sex has been used to oppress people. Sex can scar people for life. Clearly, we cannot just have it, anything goes, you know, jump on every sexual impulse you have sort of attitude towards sex. We need to have a plan, a strategy. We need to control sex so that sex doesn't control us. But how exactly do we do this? Well, before we get there, I think we should spend some time debunking the two extremes that our culture has when it comes to sex. Oftentimes, our culture offers up two different ways to look at sex, and both of them are unbiblical. And I want to spend some time debunking them. So here's the first thing you need to realize today. If you're taking notes, why don't you write this down? Number one, sex is not everything. Sex is not everything. Listen, if you were an alien from the planet Zornob and you came to visit Earth, you would think that we worshipped sex. Billboards, magazines, movies, TV shows, songs, dating apps, advertisements, Netflix reality shows, pornography websites, everything in our culture today is all about sex. You can't go to the mall without getting it shoved in your face. It's all around us and it's all screaming, sex is king. There's a whole culture of people whose main goal on the weekend is to go to the club or the bar, meet somebody, take them home, have sex with them, only to repeat the same thing the next week. Sex is an idol if there ever was one. Relationships are judged based upon whether they've done the deed or not and how pleasurable it was. Relationships are tossed aside for somebody who could potentially offer better sex. If you're not having sex, you're seen as less than. Our culture is obsessed with sex and it wants you to be obsessed with it too. We learned that last week that God created sex and that sex is powerful. But sex is not everything. Anything we revolve our lives around is an idol. And an idol takes the place of God in our lives. And when we take sex and we elevate it to God's status, we pervert this incredible gift that God has given us. I love this quote by author C.S. Lewis. He describes the reality of our world perfectly. And mind you, this was written over 70 years ago. He says this, he says, you can get a large audience together for a strip tease act. Now, suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate onto the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see just before the lights went out that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with their appetite for food? Now, what was true in 1952 is even more true today. Our world has an obsession with sex, and it's become a problem. What does the Bible say in return? In a world that tells you sex is king, that you're not really living if you're not doing it, the Bible offers up a completely different approach. In the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul writing to a church that had an unhealthy obsession with sex. He says this, now concerning the matters you wrote uh, about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the sexual temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Did you hear that? He actually said it's good for someone not to have sex. What, what's he saying here? What he's doing is he's actually pushing against the idea that sex is king. Paul himself was actually celibate, meaning that he never married. And he continues on to say this. He says, now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I am myself. But each one has his own gift from God, 
one of one kind and one of another. What he's saying is, in my personal opinion, I wish everyone would stay single like I am. Do you see what the Bible is telling us here? No, listen, it was not normal to stay celibate in the first century, and it's not normal today either. If you're not dating, married, or in a relationship, having sex, you're looked down upon. You watch shows like This Is Us or Love Is Blind and everything is telling you that happiness is found in relationships. Sex and marriage is certainly not bad, but singleness is not bad either. You're not less than. This idea has seeped into the church as well, even Broadway church. If you're single and you walk through the church halls, I guarantee you'll hear comments like, how is a young gal like you still single? Or don't worry, God has someone for you as if you're somehow inferior. The Bible says something very different. It says it's actually better if you can stay single. If God has given you the gift of celibacy, now notice the Bible doesn't say the curse of celibacy, it's the gift of celibacy. In a lot of ways it's better, why? Because you were not created for the purpose of getting married and starting a family. God is not the host of some sort of dating show trying to set people up with each other. Marriage, relationships, and sex are a gift, but we should never value the gift over the giver of the gift. We were ultimately created for God. So if you're single, you can live a fully fulfilled life. You're not less than, you're not inferior. In fact, you are actually perfectly positioned to live a uniquely intimate life with God. Sex is not everything. But if you're taking notes, this is our second point. Sex is not nothing either. Now, this is the complete opposite extreme, where on the one hand, our culture places sex on a pedestal and it makes it king. On the other hand, our culture can underestimate just how important it is. Our culture says stuff like, ah, it's no big deal. Everybody does it. You know, we shouldn't even give it a second thought. It's like a little two-person workout to relieve stress. No big deal. Have sex with as many people as you like, as many different partners, It's like shaking hands. It won't really affect you in the long run. We view it as this like emotionless, detached activity that serves no other purpose than releasing some dopamine into the brain. When we approach sex like this, we end up with things like friends with benefits. Two people who are just friends, no romantic interest at all, and yet they're having sex because it just feels good. And we act as if that doesn't do anything. The Bible says something very different. In Hebrews, it says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge as sexually immoral and adulterous. God gave humanity the gift of sex for a very specific purpose, to bind men and women together in a marriage relationship and to have children. And listen, the science backs this up too. Helen Fisher is a biological anthropologist and she explains it this way while she's talking about casual sex. She says, It's not casual because when you have sex with somebody and it's pleasurable, it actually drives up the dopamine system in the brain. And that can actually push you over the threshold into falling in love. When you orgasm, there's a flood of oxytocin and vasopressin. These neurochemicals are linked with the attachment systems in the brain. Listen, you are literally rewiring your brain to become more attached to the person that you're making love with. Now, in a marriage relationship, that is great news. Outside of it, that's terrible news. We have to realize today that sex is not just nothing. If it was nothing, then it wouldn't tear families apart. It wouldn't ruin marriages. It wouldn't traumatize people. As we learned last week, sex is powerful. And when we treat sex as "Eh, no big deal, you know, do it with as many people as possible, we diminish the gift that God has given us. And listen, the statistics back this up as well. There's so many studies that back this up, but I'll give you just one. The Center for Sexual Health Promotion of the Indiana University did a study that showed that couples who have sex in marriage, also known as the way God intended it, reported having sex more frequently and had higher sexual satisfaction than those who operated in today's hookup culture. Apparently, if you wanna have the most sex, And the best sex, staying single and hooking up with as many people as possible is not the way to go. Hmm, It's almost as if God knew what he was doing when he set up the guardrails for sex to be experienced. Go figure. 
So we've learned today that sex is not everything, and that sex is not nothing. And here's our final thing to remember. If you're taking notes, write this down. Doing nothing can ruin everything. What do I mean by that? I mean that we live in a broken world that twists sex into something that it's not. If we ignore that reality, we are setting ourselves up for failure. If you're a Christ follower and you want to honor God with your body and your mind, then you're being pulled in the opposite direction constantly. Trying to avoid sexual temptation in our world is like trying not to breathe. It's everywhere around us. It's not as simple as just saying, okay, I'm gonna avoid sexual immorality now. No, 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 we need to have a plan because we live in a sinful world. You will not honor God with your mind and body accidentally. You need to be intentional. The Apostle Paul actually warns about this in the Bible in a letter that he wrote to the church in the ancient city of Corinth that had its fair share of sexual immorality, he starts by comparing them to the ancient Israelites. And he says this, he says, we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day, nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did, then died from snake bites, and don't grumble as some of them did, and then they were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us of those who live at the end of the age. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. Now, there's two things in this passage that stand out to me. One of them is, to be honest, a little troubling, and the other is actually encouraging. The first one is that Paul says, let anyone who thinks he stands be careful. This means that it's easy to look at the people in the Bible and all the messed up stuff they did and think, wow, I would never do those things. But the reality is that we are just as susceptible to stumbling as they were. If you think you're standing firm, if you think it would never happen to you, you're actually most at risk of falling into this. The second thing that stands out is this, that Paul says that the temptations that overtake you are actually pretty common. You are not alone. And the temptations that you face are actually rather predictable. The tactics that the enemy uses to distract us and pull us into immorality are the same tactics that he's used for millennia. And God will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. He will provide a way out. So, How can we live pure in an impure world? How can we honor God with our bodies and our minds when temptation is all around us? Well, I wanna give you a few practical tips that's gonna help you in your battle with temptation. So if you're taking notes, here's our first one. Consider the consequences. This goes a long way to helping resist temptation. Sexual pleasure is momentary. It is a high risk, low reward payoff. And oftentimes the consequences are just not worth those few minutes of pleasure unplanned pregnancies, addictions, broken families, just to name a few. We actually see this play out in the Old Testament when David, king over Israel, walked out onto his roof and he saw a woman named Bathsheba bathing and temptation overtook him and he slept with her. David did not stop to think about the consequences of his actions. He didn't think, whoa, whoa, I'm the king. So many people look up to me. He didn't think she's married and her husband's in my army. He didn't think, I could get her pregnant. All he focused on was the potential pleasure he could get from this. And guess what? He did get her pregnant. His story of adultery ends with him arranging the death of Bathsheba's husband to keep the secret from getting out, him getting caught and called out by God's prophet. And from that moment on, King David's rule spiraled out of control. It just was never the same. All of that for moments of gratification. Consider the consequences in your own life. Who will be hurt? Who will be betrayed? How could this change your life forever? And what could this lead to? Now, in a moment of temptation, it's sometimes hard to think straight, which leads me to my next practical tip. If you're taking notes, avoiding temptation is far easier than resisting temptation. Now, this tip is probably the one that's going to help you the most. You have the power to shape your environment and what you surround yourself with. If you struggle with an alcohol dependency, You should probably stay away from bars and liquor stores. If you have a gambling addiction, stay out of casinos. And if you find yourself easily tempted sexually, 
Don't put yourself in situations that allow you to be tempted. Let's go back to the story of David and Bathsheba. Let's look at what happens right before he gives into temptation. The Bible says this, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, but David remained at Jerusalem. And immediately following this, David sees Bathsheba and he falls into temptation. But did you notice what the verse said? It was the time where kings, AKA David, go out to battle, but David didn't, he stayed home. David was not where he was supposed to be and the enemy used it as an opportunity to tempt David. Friends, so much of our battle with temptation comes down to the situations we allow ourselves to be put in. And only you know what temptations you can handle or not. Analyze your life and come up with a plan to help you better avoid temptation rather than trying to resist it. When Paul is encouraging the believers in the city of Corinth, he says this, he says, flee from sexual immorality. He doesn't say fight it, resist it, and pray really, really hard. He says, flee. Now, you should also do those things, but don't underestimate the temptation that you're facing. It's best to avoid it altogether. Here's our third tip, seek accountability. When I was in the fifth grade, I entered the science fair at my school with the project, do plants grow better in sunlight or in darkness? I know, riveting stuff. I thought I was gonna uncover some new scientific discovery, but the opposite happened. I bought two tomato plants and I put them in the same soil and I watered them the same amount. The only difference is that I kept one outside in the sun and the other in a dark closet. Now, if you passed grade two science, then you know the outcome. Plants grow better in the light, obviously. But did you know that your sin is the exact opposite? Did you know that your sin grows best in the dark? When we keep it to ourselves, when we hide it from others and we push it deep down and we think, I'll just overcome it on our own. But all of that does is strengthen sin's grasp on our lives. It's only when we bring it into the light that God can begin to heal us. And that's why we need accountability. Who in your life can you go to and be brutally honest about your struggles with? Do you have that person that you can call when you're feeling tempted, who can pray with you when you've messed up? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. If you fight alone, you will lose alone. Who do you have in your life that can keep you accountable? If your struggle is pornography, then I've actually listed a few accountability softwares in your outline that can help you set up content blockers and send reports of your internet activity to a trusted friend. Do not believe the lie that you can win this battle on your own. Here's our fourth practical tip, pray consistently. Now the key word there is consistently. Oftentimes we treat prayer like it's a last resort rather than a first step. You know, we live our lives, putting ourselves in tempting situations. And then when we're about to give in, then we cry out to God and ask him to help us. But we've got it flipped. We should be living lives of prayer, going to God daily before we ever encounter a situation where we need his help in. Believe that prayer helps and pray hard. My last tip for you today is perhaps the most important if you're taking notes. Avoid cycles of shame. What do I mean by that? I know in my life, I have fallen into cycles of shame. I know that I want to follow God. I want to avoid sexual immorality. I want to honor God with my mind and my body. And when I'm doing good, I feel on top of the world. And then I give in to temptation and suddenly I feel like the worst sinner in the world. I feel like God hates me and is disappointed in me. I feel ashamed, I feel unworthy. And instead of going to God in those moments, I run away from him because how could a God ever love a sinner like me. I'm only as close to God as my last slip up. Listen, this is not what following Jesus is about. You don't suddenly become destined for hell because you gave into temptation. And listen, God is not surprised. He knew you were gonna do that. You see, if you're here today and you've accepted God's gift of forgiveness in your life, which if you've never done that before, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that very soon. But if you've done that, then that means that Jesus has paid the price for your sin and you are forgiven. But not just the sin of your past, but your future and your present. Sometimes we live as if God's only forgiven our past. You know, we say, okay, God's forgiven me, so I better live a really good life from now on. 
And then we mess up and we feel like we've lost our salvation. Get this, when you accepted Jesus into your life and accepted his forgiveness, he knew you'd still mess up in the future. He's not surprised. He's not shocked or disgusted. He didn't just forgive your past, but he forgives your now. So while it's healthy to feel guilty for the things that we do, it's unhealthy to feel shame. Our guilt when we mess up should drive us closer to God because we know that we need him. But our shame pushes us away because we feel unworthy. The Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Nothing you can do can make God love you less. So don't fall into cycles of shame. And nothing hurts your battle with temptation more than getting stuck in these cycles. Because it, it's not about how sexually pure you are. It's about how close you're living to God's spirit, how much you're allowing him to empower you, walking with him every single day. Overcoming temptation will flow from that. But if we think that we can overcome it on our own and hope that somehow that will make God love us more, then listen, we've already lost the battle. As you go on with your day, remember, you can overcome sexual temptation. I realize that there are those of us here today that struggle with this daily, multiple times a day. And you may feel like there is no hope. You've heard every sermon like this and nothing has changed. Don't believe the lie. Remember, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. You are not alone and God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will always provide a way out. There is hope. If you're here today and you've never before made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity right now. Maybe you feel shame and guilt because of your past and you feel like, how could God ever love me? God died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price that your moral debt had racked up. All so that your sin could be forgiven so that you could return to perfect relationship with him. And if you've never made that decision before, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So if you're here today and you want to accept God's grace, just repeat these words after me. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say it under your breath or in your mind. What matters is that you mean it. Say, God, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've turned my own way and I've done my own thing. I don't deserve your love. I could never earn your love. But today I choose to accept this gift of forgiveness that you offer me. I choose to turn away from my sin and I choose to follow you. I know I won't be perfect, but I know that I'm a child of God. Thank you for new life. Today I give you mine. And God, for every other person watching today, those of us who have maybe already made a decision to follow you, I pray that you would empower us by your spirit to overcome the temptations that we face in our lives every single day, that we would run to you in moments where we mess up instead of running away from you. God, help us in our battle. I pray this all in your name. Amen. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you need prayer for anything at all, my best advice for you is to text the number on the screen right now. A pastor will get back to you and pray with you about anything that you're going through and will tell you about what your next steps are in your faith. Now, before you click off, I want to remind you that this coming Wednesday evening, we have our Better You workshops where we're going deeper into these topics of money, sex, and power. And so we're actually bringing in David Miner, who's a registered therapist and a clinical social worker, and he's going to be going a little bit deeper on this topic of sex. There's also going to be some Q&A afterwards, so we really hope that we see you there. God bless. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, please text the number on the screen. Or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, you can email new at broadwaychurch.com and a pastor will reply and help you get connected to a place where you can best serve and grow. As I mentioned earlier, here are some discussion questions you can use based on today's sermon. What are some practical steps you can take to avoid sexual temptation in your life? The speaker talked about accountability. Who could be a safe person for you where accountability can thrive in your life? How can prayer help with the struggle of temptation? Do you agree with sex is nothing or sex is everything? Why or why not? 
We pray that by engaging deeper into today's message, it will help you along in your spiritual walk. Now stick around for just a little longer as we transition into a time of communion. One day, the father of a very wealthy family wanted to take his son on a trip to help his son understand how poor people lived. So they, they took this trip to a farm and they stayed on a farm for a few days. And on the way home, the father was asking the son, how do you enjoy the trip? And the, the father said, did you really get to experience how poor people lived? The son said, I, I love the trip. He said, what I experienced was we have one dog and they have four. We have a pool that, that reaches to the middle of our garden, but they have a creek that has no end. We have lanterns imported for our garden, but they have the stars in the night. Our patio reaches to our front yard, but they have a whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on. They have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food, but they grow theirs. We have walls around our property to protect us, but they have friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. And then the boy said, thanks, Dad. Thanks for showing me how poor we really are. You see, as we come to the communion table today, we recognize that we do so regularly and, and anything that we do regularly can become a ritual, right? But we want to remember how thankful we should be when we come to the table. Thankful for what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. There's a great story about thankfulness in the New Testament in the book of Luke, chapter 17. I'm going to read it for you. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one re returned to re give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You see, thankfulness should always lead us to action. One healed leper came back. One caught himself in the midst of celebration and returned to Jesus. He reversed his steps, put his family on hold, put the priest on hold, and came back to the cause and the, the genesis of his celebration. His response and life situation were unique, but in the simplest sense of what he did, it was thankfulness, and his thankfulness led to action. And boy, did that turn out to be important. And so, the sound of Jesus' question haunts us and rings in our ears, where are the other nine? And as you approach the communion table today, ask yourself, what kind of action is Jesus looking for from me? Has God's Holy Spirit been urging me to, towards some sort of action step? Has the Lord been tugging at my heart for some step of faith? Is there something I feel compelled to do? Because thankfulness should always lead us to action. So let's come to the table. We begin by taking the bread. The bread is a symbol of Christ's broken body for us. Let's take this bread in thankfulness for what Christ has done for us. The cup is a symbol of the New Testament, sealed in the blood of Jesus. What he has done through coming living on this earth, dying and taking our sins, and conquering death on the third day. It changes everything. It's sealed in the blood of Jesus. We do this in remembrance of him. Let's take the cup together. And we remember how the Corinthians passage ends. It says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You are expressing thankfulness for what he's done. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time of communion. We thank you that every time we do this, even right now, as we take communion, 
we are reminding ourselves of what is important. What you have done for us is important. And our response of thankfulness is important. Forgive us for making this just a ritual that we do. This is an expression of thankfulness for what you have done for us that we could never do for ourselves. Thank you again. Amen. God bless you, Broadway Church. Have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Desiree and I am the Young Adults Pastor here. And guys, I'm so excited because today I have a very special guest with me. So why don't you go ahead and tell us who you are and what you do around here. Hi everyone, my name is Cherry and I'm the new preteen director at the Vancouver campus. Amazing, and even though you're the new preteen director, you're not new to Broadway. You've worked at City Reach, you are working at Out of School Care, you're a part of youth, young adults, you're on the worship team, so many different areas of our church. Yeah, and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Well, at Broadway, we have a ton of stuff happening here for you and your families. So why don't you check these things out? We are excited to announce an upcoming men's retreat on March 24 to 26 at Solway Camp and Conference Center. Men, save the date! Details and registration are on our website. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with Pastor Andy. Today we have an information meeting about our short-term missions trip to the Yukon. This trip is for both youth and young adults ages 15 to 25. The info meeting is happening at our Vancouver campus after the 11.15 a.m. and 6 p.m. services in room 203. Please attend if you're interested in going on this trip. Broadway Basics is a three-week course about who we are and what we do. It's also a prerequisite for membership, so if you're interested in learning more about Broadway or becoming a member, please join us. This class is available at all campuses and begins next Sunday, February 5th. Please sign up online. If you have little ones aged zero to five, we would love for you to join us at Parent and Talk and connect with other families and their kids. It happens on Thursday mornings between 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the nursery at the Vancouver campus. For more information or if you have any questions, please contact Pastor Monica. Next Sunday, February 5th at 6 p.m., we are kicking off our first encounter night of the new year and it's happening at the Port Coquitlam campus. Encounter Night is an evening of uninterrupted prayer and worship, and you are not going to want to miss it. All campuses are invited. If you are looking for ways to connect and build community, joining a small group is a wonderful way to grow spiritually and meet new friends. If you would also like to participate in a small group as a leader or as a host, we would love for you to connect with us. For more information, check out our website or you can email Pastor Andy. If you miss anything that we said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on all of our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.